Hello GCSE students and welcome to year 11 physics revision and we're on the first topic of paper 2 which is topic 5 forces. As always you can expect clear concise explanations from me an experienced teacher, loads of exam questions to make sure you really hit those marking schemes to get the top marks and large slides designed for mobile phone viewing so you can study wherever you are and don't forget to click the more button so it splits the video up into 5 or 10 minute manageable segments. So instead of spending 10 minutes watching your friend dancing on TikTok, you can maybe spend 10 minutes doing a bit of study. And repetition, repetition, repetition is the key. Watch a little segment once it'll sink in, watch it again a bit more and a bit more and so on. Space revision is the most powerful study technique going. So we're doing forces in motion today and this is a big topic. It is the biggest topic in all three sciences. So therefore I've decided to split this video into two parts. In part one, I will be covering the basics, gravity, resultant forces, springs, moments, and a bit of atmospheric pressure. And then in video two, I'll be doing more about motion, acceleration, the godfather himself, Newton of all these things, and finally car safety and momentum. It is a lot, but if you take little steps, a little bit at a time, and repetition, 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 you'll prevent cognitive overload, your brain won't get overloaded, and the stuff will sink in. So that is the key. So anyway, if you don't get it, you can use player pause, you can rewind, and it will eventually, like, as I said, sink into your brain. you just got to keep going over it. So topic five, forces. May the force be with you. So here we go. Starting off, I've got some good news and some bad news. The bad news first, if you are doing higher level, there's a lot of equations that you will have to memorize for your exam. However, the good news is once you can memorize an equation and rearrange it, you're pretty much guaranteed to pass your physics paper. That's pretty much what physics is all about. It's a guaranteed pass. So once you can do that, you're on easy street. You should have happy, smiley faces. You must show your workings out for all the questions. It's all or nothing, okay? We are all human, and in the pressure of an exam, you can make silly mistakes. I do it all the time, so it's all about minimizing the damage. Getting some marks is better than nothing, and if you show your workings out, you'll get some marks, and that will, could be the difference between a whole grade. So let's get this party started. Let's get talking about forces and motion. Firstly, what is a force? A force is something that can alter the state of motion or rest of any object or deform it. In plain English, you can push it, you can pull it, you can squeeze it, you can stretch it, okay? You need to know these two terms, scalar and vector. Scalar quantities have size only, and I remember that with the S for scalar, speed, mass, volume, and time. Vector quantities have size and direction. So the example would be a car. I could tell you a car is going at 10 miles an hour, but I'm not saying what direction, that's scalar. I could tell you it's going at 10 miles an hour east, that is vector, because I'm saying it's size and direction. So on to contact and non-contact forces. Contact forces have to touch. For example, friction, the box has to touch the floor for the force of friction to become a factor. Air resistance, the parachute has to touch the air for air resistance to become a factor. These are contact forces. Non-contact forces, there are three main ones, magnetism, gravitational force, and the electrostatic force. We'll mainly do magnetism in topic seven. Uh, the electrostatic force you've done in topic two, electricity, in topic four, atomic structure, and fission and fusion, and we're gonna look at the gravitational force in detail in just a moment. Remember the electrostatic force? Opposite charge is attracting, light charge is repelling. The magnetic force, the poles of the magnet do not have to be touching for you to feel that repulsion in your hands. And in fact, the magnetic force is the reason we have life on Earth. Why does Earth look so lush, yet Mars is a cold, lifeless desert? The reason is this. The Earth has a magnetic field, it has an iron core, and it acts like a force field blocking us from a lot of the sun's radiation, which would strip our atmosphere away. So that's why the Earth looks nice and lush, and Mars is a cold, lifeless world. Now, onto the gravitational force. What goes up 
must come down as one of the most famous phrases in science from Isaac Newton. Technically not true. If you launch stuff with enough force in a rocket, it won't come back down. But in general, when you throw something up, it will come back down. So what is gravity? Gravity is the force of attraction between two objects with mass. Do not say it acts like a magnet. So Newton famously uh, saw an apple falling from a tree. Some say it fell onto his head. And that led him to think, what force? What force made the apple fall down? And he came up with his theory of gravity. And it's based on two things. Mass. The more massive an object, the stronger the force of gravity. The sun has a stronger force of gravity than Earth. And also, distance. The closer two objects are together, the stronger the force of gravity. The further they are apart, the weaker. So Mercury will feel the sun's gravity more strongly than Earth. And Earth will feel the sun's gravity more strongly than Neptune. So... The key thing about Newton was he right realized that the same force that made the apple fall from the tree was the for same force that made the moon go around the earth was the same force that made the planets go around the sun. It is the first great unification in physics is universal law of gravitation. But gravity is actually a very weak force. It's a trillion, trillion, trillion times weaker than the electrostatic force. And I know big numbers get thrown across all the time in science, but a trillion seconds is 32,000 years worth of seconds. It's a big number. So a trillion, trillion, trillion is just mind-blowing. For example, you are probably watching this video on a phone. The whole of planet Earth, all six billion trillion tons is pulling down on the phone with its gravity yet you are easily able to overcome it with the muscles in your hand you do know gravity from tides the moon is responsible for the earth's tides that is the pulling of the oceans so twice a day depending on the rotation of the earth you will get high tides where the water is pulled in or low tides where it flows out and once a month, spring tide is the wrong term because that implies once a year, the sun will line up with the moon and that really gives a big gravitational pull and you'll get really high tides like this 28 meter monster here. So we're going to learn a bit more about Keanu Reeves as well and he's going to teach us a bit about forces but that is later on. Now on to weight, mass and gravity. It is one of the biggest mistakes we make in daily life. We confuse weight and mass. When we are asked to say how much this person weighs, you would say 88 kilograms, when in reality you should be saying his weight is in Newton. So weight and mass are different. So what is going on? We're going to take a look at this astronaut, Dave. His mass is 120 kilograms. But Dave's in danger, and you're going to see in a moment. He launches off from the space shuttle. I was actually lucky enough to see a space shuttle launch. Wow, the power of those engines. It goes up to space, but uh-oh, there's been an explosion and Dave has been blown out into space. Now, here's the key point. His mass will still be 120 kilograms, but because there's no gravitational pull on him anymore, his weight is now zero newtons. And this illustrates the key difference between mass and weight. Now, lucky for Dave, an alien spacecraft has just come along to save his life, and he's okay, he's going to get home safely. But, anyway, the difference between mass and weight. Mass is the amount of matter in an object. It does not change with gravity, and it's measured in kilograms. Weight does change with gravity, and is measured in Newton. So this brings us on to our first equation, Weight is equal to mass times gravity. And the strength of gravity is 9.8 newtons. That number will be given to you in your exam. Although if you were doing foundation level, they rounded up to 10. Just depends on the question. Now, unless you're going to be an astronaut and actually leave the Earth, okay, which, being honest, that's most of us watching this video, including me, are not, then you are still going to use the wrong thing. You're going to say that is 3.8 kilograms mass weight of potatoes when well, you should really say 37.24 newtons although if you did that people would think you're a bit weird so just keep with kilograms for now so here are the different planets in the solar systems they will all have different masses so we'll have different gravitational field strengths jupiter is the biggest with 25.95 and there is earth highlighted for you 
So to get this mass and weight, you just multiply mass times gravity. 1 times 9.8 and so on. At the bottom, 28 times 9.8, 274.4. Here are some other examples of gravity. The earth pulling on the moon, but the moon is also pulling on the earth. The earth pulling on that baby, but the baby is also pulling up on the earth. Those couple in the corner are actually attracted to each other, and there's the solar system as well. So here's an example of an astronaut going to the moon. His mass does not change. It's still 100 kilograms. But because the strength of gravity on the moon is one-sixth that of Earth, his weight decreases by a sixth. So you might want to just pause for a second and read through this to make sure you understand the force of gravity. And here's an example of a higher level question where you'll be asked to rearrange to find the strength of gravity on the moon. So Newton, he did the maths for gravity, but he had no idea how it worked. There's like 384,000 kilometers between the Earth and the moon. How actually does this non-contact force work? How does the Earth influence the moon? He didn't have a clue. He, if you want to pause this for a moment and read through it, I know it's old English, but he goes, I don't have a clue what's going on. So it was Albert Einstein who actually figured out what gravity was. It's not on your course, but it only takes a sec. He realized it was the curving of space and time and that the planets and objects follow the curve. So here is a satellite following the curve of the Earth. Here's the moon following the curve of the Earth. Here's the Earth following the curve of the Sun, and here are the planets following the curve of the Sun. That's what gravity actually is, it's the curving of space. And here's the Sun following the curve of the Milky Way. So here's a real life exam question where you have to rearrange for gravity again. 300 newtons, the actual value is 293, they rounded it up. And now we're on to center of mass, and it's all about balance and stability. The blue section there will be balanced by the green section there, okay? So what is the center of mass? It is the point at which weight may be considered to act or a mass appears to be concentrated. It's all about balancing stuff, really. That's what it's all about. This is unstable. Its center of mass will not be stable. You would not come back the next day and find that pencil still there. You know it's unstable. Whereas this staple pardon the pun, is stable and will still be in the same position the next day unless a force acts upon it. So I'm going to talk about some centre of mass questions. Again, what is the centre of mass, the point at which weight may be considered to act? Here is a gravity question. Calculate the mean weight of a tomato. Well, there's five tomatoes there that weigh 420 grams. You convert that uh, for... Uh, 425 grams you convert it divide by 5 and then multiply by 9.8 to get 0.833 newtons here's another exam question draw an x at the center of mass in the toy just anywhere along the legs that's easy now suggest suggest questions are tough and don't okay suggest two ways in which the design could make the toy more stable bigger feet feet wider apart head lighter and smaller there's lots of suggestions but don't waste too much time on suggest questions they're only worth one or two marks and students waste too much time on them and get all flustered don't if you did if it doesn't come to you and then in 20 seconds move on so we're now on to resultant forces and this is a key definition you must remember for your exam what is a resultant force <coughs> A resultant force is a single force that has the same effect as all the individual forces acting on an object combined. So here you have weight, that's mass due to gravity. You have the frictional force. The applied force will be someone pushing the box. Now I want to talk about this normal force, okay? Because it's kind of not explained very well. How does a table push upwards? How does your chair push upwards against your bum? How do your feet push? How does the floor push upwards against your feet? What's going on? How can solid objects push? Well, what's going on is actually this: there are atoms in your bum, and on the outside of your uh, of these are negatively charged particles called electrons. 
there are atoms in the chair, which also have negatively charged particles called electrons on the outside. So there is electrostatic repulsion. That's what the normal force is. And that's what keeps, stops your bum going through the chair. Here is a man pushing a box. Why doesn't his hands go through the walls of the box? Well, there's electrostatic repulsion. That is what the normal contact force actually is. It's the electrostatic repulsion between the atoms and objects. Not that hard to explain. I don't know why they don't explain it to you, but that's what it is. Anyway, on to resultant forces. If they are going in the same direction, you add them. 10 plus 20 is 30. If they're going in different directions, you subtract them. 40 minus 20 is 20. And at the same one, 25 minus 20 minus 25 is zero. There's no resultant force that will be traveling at a constant velocity or be still. Here's some other examples. Very easy. Now, draw a... Here's an accelerating speedboat. And the speedboat is going to stay in the water, so it's going to stay at a constant height, so its weight will be matched by the uptrust of the water. However, it is accelerating, so the push force from the engine will be greater than the air and water resistance. Air resistance there, as you can see by the numbers here. I can also find out the mass of the boat if I wanted by dividing its weight by 9.8. Just out of curiosity, just so you know that. Now back to Newton, okay, you can't, Newton we're going to do mainly in video two, however we cannot talk about resultant forces without talking about Newton's first law. An object will stay at rest or tend to stay in its motion unless acted upon by a force. So what is inertia? The tendency for an object to continue in its state of rest or its state of motion. In an earlier slide, you saw a stapler. It's going to stay where it is unless someone pushes it. Okay, there we go there. And for uh, state of motion, I like to picture space probes out in deep space. They're going to travel in a straight line at a constant velocity. Why wouldn't they? There's no forces acting upon them anymore. They're out of fuel. They're just going to go straight on. So onto this, here's a, all the forces are balanced. If all the forces are balanced, the resultant force will be zero and the object will either stay at rest or keep moving at a constant velocity. If all the forces are not balanced, then the object will be accelerating. That is the key to Newton's first law and it's the key to resultant forces. Now, it's a matter of life and death. Why am I talking about life and death? Aeroplanes. Aeroplanes are an excellent example of resultant forces in action. So let's take a look at this aeroplane. It's traveling at a constant height because its weight is matched by the lift. 600 minus 600 is zero. However, it is accelerating because the engine thrust is greater than air resistance. Now here's an aeroplane cruising where all the forces are balanced. The resultant force will be zero, so constant height and constant velocity. Now, however, this is science, it's not art. You're not expected to be able to draw aeroplanes. We can just use dots instead. So that's what we do in free body diagrams. We just use dots to represent objects. So here is an aeroplane at a terminal. The plane is stationary. Draw a free body diagram to represent this. Well, the size of the arrows will match the weight the up trust. Where am I getting 686,000 from? It is 70,000 times 9.8. Now the aeroplane is taking off. This means the forces will be unbalanced and we can show that in our free body diagram. The up thrust will be greater than the weight as the plane is going up in the air and the thrust from the engine will be greater than the air resistance as it is accelerating down the runway. Now the plane is at cruising altitude, it's just normal in the middle of its flight, it's where it spends most of its time. Here the forces will all be balanced. The weight will be balanced by the up thrust, and the thrust of the engines will be balanced by the air resistance. Key point, the resultant force is zero, so it will be traveling at a constant velocity. Now the aeroplane is coming in to land, let's see what's going on here. Well, clearly the weight will be bigger than the up thrust now as it is uh, coming into land. And finally, the air resistance will be bigger than the thrust. It's decelerating. Now, here's a real life exam question of a fisherman pulling a boat. Describe the motion. Well, 
it will be forward because the 300 newtons is bigger than the 250 and you must say it's accelerating as the forces are unbalanced here's some other exam questions here you can read this yourself very very easy Now, the pushing force does not make the brick move. Why? Because it's balanced by the force of friction, so the resultant force is zero. The weight of the brick does not make the, uh, the brick move downwards because it's balanced by the upwards force of the table. The resultant force is zero. Okay, it's just, that's all, what it's all about. Now, we're on to the final part of the topic A, work done. Work done is equal to force multiplied by distance. Just be aware that distance is not D, it is S for some reason. I don't know why, because P stands for power, pressure, density, and momentum. So they could have just made the distance, but they decided to confuse you. So just remember, S is distance, not D. So what is work done? Work done is force multiplied by distance, in this case, 45 times 1.4 is 63 and it's joules. Work done and energy are the same thing and are measured in J joules. So here's an example and I'm looking at four marks. So what's the trick? The trick is I must convert from kilograms to newtons. So weight is equal to mass times gravity at the bottom, 15 times 9.8. And then I write out my equation, work done is equal to force times distance. I rearrange for distance and I get 9 meters. Here's a real life exam question here. The reason you get an extra mark even though it's straightforward multiplication is you have to convert the 7.5 kilometers to 7,500 meters. That is the unit of distance. So that is the basics introduction done, well done, and now we are on to, you can maybe take a little time out, a little break, and we come back for topic 5B, forces and their effects. This is to do with springs, moments, that's all gears, twisting forces, wrenches, levers, and finally atmospheric pressure and so on. So here are springs, and you've come across springs before, when we talked about elastic potential energy in paper one, and the key point here is the spring constant K. What does K mean? K tells you how much energy is needed to stretch or compress a spring. So, and it's measured in newtons by meters, okay? So how many newtons to stretch it by a meter? If it's got a low spring constant, it's easy to stretch. That would be like the slinky dog from Toy Story. If it's got a high spring constant, it would be hard to stretch. That would be like a mattress spring from a bed. So the key point is very often your measurement of the stretching will be in centimeters. You must divide by 100 to get the correct answer to convert it to meters. That is the key exam trick here. So we're on to uh, one of our key experiments that's on your course. It's investigating spring and it's called the Hooke's Law Experiment. Robert Hooke was, was an English scientist. He did a lot of work with microscopes. He invented the word cell, but we're looking at him in physics here. So we're looking at Hooke's Law, which is force is equal to the spring constant times the extension. That means how far the spring is stretched and or compressed or squeezed what it means in plain english is in order to stretch or squeeze a spring you need a force and it should be directly proportional but here's how you set up your experiment you get a clamp stand you have your spring there you have weights hanging off the spring and you keep on adding masses to provide the force and you measure the extension with a ruler it's as simple as that that is your experiment and by measuring the extension and by drawing a graph of force versus extension, you can find the spring constant K. K is equal to F divided by E. And you should get a straight line that's directly proportional. Just be aware that even when a spring is not stretched, when there is no force, it will still have some length or some extension. It won't be zero, just to be aware of that. So... You get this directly proportional line. Here's a real life exam question. Determine the spring constant. Well, they've given it to me in meters. I don't have to convert from meters to centimeters. So it's pretty easy. 
F is equal to K times E. Rearrange it for K, you get 40 Newton meters. Now you must be aware of the limit of proportionality. That's a fancy way for saying springs can be broken. When they don't go back to their normal shape, they are broken and they can no longer use it to find the spring constant. It's called the limit of proportionality and it's when it's no longer directly proportional. It will start curving off either down or up Either way, it's beyond the limit of proportionality. You need to know what elastically deformed means. When a spring is elastically deformed, it will return to its original shape or length when the force is removed. You haven't broke it. When it's just deformed, you have broken it. So here is a six mark exam question for the write up. You might want to play or pause this. How do you write up the exam uh, at write up? Well, here is the diagram of the apparatus. And here's what you would need to be able to do. So just spend a moment reading through this. Pause the video. And your risk assessment as well. Maybe something might fall on your feet or something like that. Here's a question again. You've just done this. We know it's 40 Newton meters. And finally, because you don't say force here, elastic potential energy. Nice, easy three more question then. The key point is I have to convert from 20 centimeters to 0.2 meters. That's where the extra mark, third mark comes from. Here's another four mark question for this. I have to rearrange the equation. But I also have to convert from centimeters to meters. So that's where I get the extra mark there. And here's the real life marking scheme to show I am telling you the truth. Here's another one. Four marks. Now, this is where it's compressed. It's squeezed instead of stretched. So it was 30 centimeters. Now it's 23. It's been squeezed by seven centimeters. I must convert that seven centimeters at the bottom to meters to get my proper answer of 4,900 Newton meters. So, other examples of combining equations. I just made these up myself. Just play and pause your way through them. Here I'm just combine, combining weight and gravity along with this. So I find that force and the weight are the same thing. Here's another example with Ariana Grande. You can just play and pause through these. Make sure you know where the numbers are coming from. Compress 17 centimeters. Here's another example where you have to calculate the mass. So you get the force first and then calculate the mass. Mass and force and weight are the same thing, 50 kilograms. And finally, how many centimeters? I must multiply my answer at the end by 100. Just pause that to make sure you know where they all come from. Now we are on to moments. Moments is anything to do with twisting or turning forces. Here you see a man turning a screw with a wrench, okay? Moments is not to do with time. It's all about twisting. However, we do use a clock to say what direction. We do use time to say what direction we are turning. If we are turning something from left to right, we say clockwise direction. If we are turning from right to left, we say the anti-clockwise direction. So we do use time in that regard. Now, to calculate moments, moments is equal to force multiplied by distance force is equal in newtons distance is meters so the unit of the moment is the newton meter and the bigger the distance the bigger the moment the bigger the force the bigger the moment just multiply them together the key point is you must also say what direction so if it's on the left hand side it's anti-clockwise 0.4 times 4 is 1.6 here in the second one, it's going to be clockwise. And then in the bottom one, it's going to be anti-clockwise. Four times 0.25 is one Newton meter anti-clockwise. So what's going to happen here? What, will it turn anti-clockwise or clockwise? Well, on the right-hand side, six times 50 is 300 Newton meters, but four times 80 is 320. So it will turn anti-clockwise with a moment of 20 Newton meters. Here, this seesaw is balanced because they both add up to a thousand. This is balanced because it, even though it's 20 times less massive, it's 20 times further away from the pivot. 
So you can balance like that. And Archimedes, he's the famous scientist who jumped out of the bat going Eureka, which means I've got it. He said, if I had a lever long enough, I could lift the whole of planet Earth. Well, let's calculate how long this lever would have to be. I would say it's going to have to be pretty long to lift the whole planet. Well, it, let's do the maths. There is the mass of the Earth. To get the weight of the Earth, I multiply by 9.8, and I get this ridiculous number 5.86 by 10 to the 25 newtons. Now, what I'm trying to find is this purple number D in the middle. So Archimedes is pushing down with a for moment of for a turning force of 490 newton meters. Let's see what the distance is. Rearranging the equation, I get. 13,300,000 light years. To put that into scale, our galaxy is only 100,000 light years across, so it'd be 13.3 of our galaxies. A, just a ridiculously long number. But technically, he would be correct if Earth wasn't on its own and out of space. He would be correct. Now, we use moments all the time. Here's a screwdriver lifting the lid off a tin of paint. Very difficult to do without using a screwdriver there here's a scissors that uses a twisting turning force it uses moments and gears are a good one as well where you'll see in bicycles that they use gears so here's a real life exam question on gears describe how the force on the pedal causes a moment around the rear axle well the force on the pedal causes a moment around the pedal axle and that will cause the force on the chain. The chain will obviously turn and that will cause a moment around the rear axle. So just spend a moment looking at that. Pardon the pun. Here's another one to do with anti-clockwise moments. So the anti-clockwise moment is 0.15 newton meters. And because it's balanced, I know the clockwise moment is also 0.15 and I can use that to find the weight of the rice in the basket, as in the market scheme, as 2.5 newtons. And they throw in a gravity question here. Weight is equal to mass times gravity. Rearranging for mass, I get 0.215 kilograms there. Here's a nice easy one. His weight is 400 newtons, 400 times 1.5. Just multiply the two numbers, it's that easy. That's probably a foundation level question. Now, and the top the seesaw is balanced. So the boy would be slightly heavier than the girl because it's balanced, and there's, but the moments are the same. The anti-clockwise moment is equal to the clockwise moment. Now they both get off and they move the seesaw, the plank of wood, towards the girl. What's going to happen now? They move it 0.25 meters. Describe and explain the rotation of the seesaw. Well, it's clearly going to turn towards the girl. Here's how you explain it scientifically. The plank rotates clockwise, as you can see with my green arrow, because the total clockwise moment is greater than the total anti-clockwise moment because of the additional weight of the seesaw when you move it. Here are some tougher questions, okay? There's some very tough questions they ask on moments, so you need to pay attention. The boy gets off and is replaced by a bigger boy, even in the diagram the boy's the same size, but I will ignore that. Calculate the weight of the bigger boy. The key point is it's balanced, and if it's balanced, the clockwise moment is equal to the anti-clockwise moment. And once I figure out the anti-clockwise moment in green, I can use that to find the weight of the bigger boy. Now, this would be a grade 8 to 9 question, okay? It will be a tough question. So, the in green, the anti-clockwise moment is 300 times 2 for the girl, plus 0.25 times the plank is 270. That's given in the question. Gives me 667.5 six, six, newton meters. That's going to equal my clockwise in red. So when I rearrange my equation, because the distance is 1.5, 445 newtons. This would be a really tough question to get into an exam. Here's another tough question they've asked before. Again, it's unfair, but they have to separate these grade 9 students out somehow. Calculate the elastic potential energy stored in the spring. This is a six mark question involving three equations. 
So the spring is stretched by E, elastic potential energy. I just need to find K. If I can find K, I can get my answer. Well, let's try and find K. First of all, uh, if you look at equation two, F is equal to K times E. K is equal to F over E. I know E is 0 0.25, but I don't know the force just yet. So I have to use the moment equation at the top to find the force. Moment is equal to force times distance. Force is equal to moment over distance. The moment is given in the question is 924 divided by the distance 0 0.15. That's in the red square. That's where I get the force, which means that's where I get the value K, 24,640 Newton meters. And then I plug it into the elastic potential energy equation. You'll have to memorize all three of these equations. And I get my correct answer as 770 joules. That would be a really tough question, but it is worth six marks, so it's going to be tough. Now we're nearly at the finishing line. We're nearly there for this first topic. So we're on to the final part, which is pressure in fluids. Now in physics, liquids and gases are considered to be fluids because the particles can move, not just liquids alone. So what is pressure? Pressure is a force that comes from particles colliding at right angles, that's 90 degrees, with the walls of a container. In a solid, the particles can't move, so they're not colliding with anything, okay? So here are the particles colliding at right angles with a container. This leads us on to our equation. Pressure is equal to force divided by area. And in a fluid, the force goes in all directions. So what is the unit of pressure? The unit of pressure is the Pascal, and it's equal to one Newton meter squared. Meter squared is a unit of area. Newton is a unit of force. It's the equivalent of sprinkling a bit of sugar on a mat that size. It's not a big unit, the Pascal. We tend to use kilopascals a lot because it's so small. So by changing the area, you can change the pressure. When you turn this block sideways, you will increase the pressure because the same force is going through a na narrower area. We use this principle in knives. We know this sharp knife will cut the celery easily because it's got a small area. We know using the same force that my finger will not be able to cut through the celery as it has a large area, so the pressure will decrease. Here's another example of that. When I decrease the area of the piston, I increase the pressure from 200 to 500 pascals. Very simple. Pressure is equal to force divided by area. So next talk about pressure and volume. Okay, Volume is how much space an object takes up. Now, when at, it has a large volume, there will be a low pressure. This is got the particles of loads of space. They're not going to collide with the walls of the container too often, so there's a low pressure. Now when I squeeze it down, so there's a much smaller volume on the right, the particles will collide with the walls of the container more frequently, and therefore you'll have a higher pressure. They are inversely proportional. Volume and pressure are inversely proportional. The larger the volume, the lower the pressure. The smaller the volume, the higher the pressure. Let's talk about pressure and temperature. When it's cold, the particles aren't moving with a lot of energy. They don't collide with the walls of the container with a lot of force. When the temperature is high, the particles are rocketing all over the place and they do collide with the walls of the container with a lot of force and with a lot more frequency. So the molecules have more kinetic energy to so collide with the walls with more force and more frequency. You will find it is directly proportional. If you double the temperature, you double the pressure. If you treble the temperature, you treble the pressure and so on. Now we're going to split up liquids and gases and then we're nearly done. So pressure in liquids. Hydraulics is a very important thing in this world. You're going to see with brakes in a moment. It's a bit like magic, but the key point is this. It's a way of transmitting forces using liquids. Liquids cannot be compressed. So it can be used to transfer and amplify forces using the equation pressure is equal to force divided by area. So I'm going to show you this. On the left hand side the force is pushing downwards because a liquid cannot be compressed. 
the right hand side will go upwards that is how hydraulics works the key point is if i change the area i can change the amount of stuff the load i can lift so i'm pushing down on the left hand side but i can lift a much bigger load on the right hand side because the area has changed so in this example only 10 newtons of force is pushing down on the left but 250 newtons of force is coming out on the right and at first glance it's like you're defying the laws of physics it's like you're breaking the law of conservation of energy what is going on well the key point is this okay if you pay close attention it's all to do with the area okay when you increase the area by 25 times I'm also increasing the force, okay, by 25 times. But the trade-off is this. The trade-off is the distance. I can only lift the object 25 times less high. So that is the key point. So I'm pushing down 25 times more on the left than the right. But when you only have to just move something a tiny bit, like brake pads, this is where it becomes useful so the guy slams on the brakes that will squeeze the brake fluid the liquid in yellow and that will cause them to touch the wheel and the friction will stop the wheel the kinetic energy of the wheel is changed to heat this is how brakes work how does this man actually lift up a car using hydraulics well that force from the man pushes down and the area on the car is much wider so here let's take a look at the marking scheme here the downward force produces a pressure in the liquid. This pressure is transmitted equally through the liquid and pressure is equal to force over area. The area at the load is bigger, so the force will be bigger. Simple as that. Force is equal to pressure times area. Here's another example here. Calculate the force. This is basically testing can you multiply using scientific notation force is equal to pressure times area there you go here's another example here calculate the force Pro just multiple forces pressure times area all the numbers are given to you in the question there you go 84,000 newtons pressure in liquids and this is particularly important about depth and diving and all that kind of stuff okay because water pressure can be very very high and very very dangerous diving is a dangerous thing to do the further you go down the higher the water pressure that's common sense there's more pressure above your head and you can see that as the spurts come out of the tube okay so when you go down 30 meters the pressure increases by four atmospheres and your lungs get four times smaller it gets tougher and tougher to breathe okay the depth of the ocean is way higher than mount everest and we basically have only gone down there once the deepest point is called the mariana trench a trench and we just went down once in 1960 and that was it We've been to the surface of the moon six times and we're going to be going back pretty soon. So we know way more about the surface of the moon than we do about the depths of the ocean. However, we do know that there are plenty of fish down there and they live off the energy of these uh, geysers called, and they're called extremophiles. You'll learn about them in biology. These weird deep fish that look like aliens. Now, this is a bit sad, but there was this uh, wreck here, the Titanic in 1912. And in 2013, this submarine went down to try and visit it. And the water pressure caused it to instantly implode, unfortunately killing the crew. Now, it killed them very quickly. They wouldn't have felt anything. But that shows you the danger of water pressure. You might remember reading about that incident. So here is the equation for pressure in a liquid. Pressure is equal to height times the density of the liquid times the gravitational field strength in plain english the higher the amount of liquid the more pressure the denser the liquid the more pressure and the stronger the gravitational field pulling down the liquid the more pressure do i like the way they have the same letter twice in the same equation certainly not but what can i do so just imagine an imaginary column of kind of liquid above a man and you can then use that to find the equation 
So what is the pressure at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest point in the ocean? It is 11,034 meters deep. The density of water, 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. Plug in your numbers and you get 108 million pascals. Very, very, very high. A diver felt a pressure of 156,800 pascals. What distance was she below the surface? Well, write out your equation. Distance means height. So I rearrange it for height. Plug in my numbers and I get 16 meters. Make sure you're able to follow that. And here's a real life exam question. A person swims from a depth of 0.5 to 1.7 meters. That's 1.2 meters. They give you the density of seawater. It's 1030, the extra bit coming from the salt. And you just multiply the, the numbers together for four marks. Four marks. And if you put the Newton meter squared or the Pascal, that gets you the final mark. Explain why the forces on the brick at the bottom cause the brick to be stationary. This is back to a resultant forces question. So the up thrust from the water and the normal contact force, that would be the brick on the ground, is equal to the weight. So therefore the resultant force is zero. They always throw in resultant forces. Now there's a real play and pause question here. When the brick is at the bottom of the pool, the top of the surface is 2.5 meters. That's the height. The force acting on the brick is 637 newtons. Calculate the density of the water in the swing, swimming pool. Step one on the right, I write out my equation. P is equal to H times P times G. I gave capital P just to differentiate between the density one. I rearrange for density. I know my height is 2.5 meters. I know the strength of gravity is 9.8. If only I could find out what's in green, I can find my answer. That brings me to the left. Pressure is equal to force over area. My force is 637 newtons. That's given in the question. The area I must convert from centimeters to meters of that diving brick. I get 0 0.025 meters squared. When I divide it in, I get 25,480 newtons, and then I can get my answer. Here is a six mark question. It would be for grade eight to nine students, but as you can see, I'm not telling you any lies. That is the correct answer. Finally, atmospheric pressure. We're looking at gases here. This thin layer of atmosphere is the reason for all the life on Earth. Without it, we'd be exposed to the vacuum of space. And the earth would look like the moon okay so the atmosphere is very important and the pressure of the atmosphere at sea level is quite high it's 100 kilopascals or 100,000 pascals you might have seen an experiment to demonstrate this where your teacher put a bit of water into a can and heated it they then that vaporized the water to steam creating a kind of vacuum and then when you put the can in cold water it instantly condenses and it is crushed by the atmospheric pressure the reason we're not crushed is we have a pressure inside our body pushing outwards which balances the atmospheric pressure so the pressure at the top of mount everest is only a third that of sea level thirty-three thousand pascals because the atmosphere is a lot thinner the higher you go up the lower the atmospheric pressure as it gets less and less and less because there's just less gas up there it's kind of a dead zone. Nothing can survive up that high. You get all these terrible symptoms and you just really got to get up to Mount Everest, up and back down. And just remember, in case you're feeling bad about yourself and successful people, there's 200 bodies of successful people who wanted to climb Mount Everest and they're still left up there because it's too much effort to get them down. Here's a poor guy who died in 1996 and he's still there at Green Boots. He's kind of used as a landmark. It's sad, but it's just the way it is. Here's another graph showing the altitude. And the boiling point of water is only 65 degrees at the top of Mount Everest because of the lower atmospheric pressure. So explain, real life exam question, why atmospheric pressure decreases with increasing altitude. Here's why. There's air molecules colliding with a surface create a pressure. At increasing altitude, there will be fewer molecules, so there will be a fewer number of collisions, so therefore the pressure will decrease.
Now, here's a really tough question to do with airplanes and windows. Don't worry too much if you don't get this. This is quite a hard question. But basically, the outside pressure is 70 kPa, or the pressure inside the cabin is 70. What's the pressure outside at the height of 12 kilometers? You have to use the grasp to find that it's 20. So the overall pressure difference is 50 kilopascals, which you then rearrange to 50,000. Two significant figures. Very tough question this. You might want to go over it a couple of times to grade it, but only do it if you're a grade 8 or 9 student. I wouldn't worry too much about it. But another question from the same. Explain why the window has been designed to have this shape. Because the force from the air pressure acting inside is bigger than outside, so it keeps the wind in, window in position. You wouldn't want this happening, which happened in 1990, where the window popped open and the pilot was sucked out. And he had to be held on by the legs, but he did survive, thank God. Now this is the final thing, we are on to up thrust. Will something float or sink? This is the final part of this section. So what is, as you can see, the final part, up thrust. Up thrust is a resultant force from a fluid that acts as it pushes upwards on an object. So apples, why don't apples sink? Because their density is less than water, 0.75 grams con compared to one gram. So three quarters of an apple will sink into water, leaving 0.25 left over. Whereas if you take a look at a potato, the density of a potato is 1.38 grams. It will completely sink to the bottom. As I'm sure any of you cooking know, potatoes sink. That's why the potato weighs less, the water weighs less than the potato, so the potato is denser. Now, why am I going all nasty? Why is the Grim Reaper showing up? Well, why do living bodies sink and dead bodies float? Living bodies sink because although we're mostly water, we have bones which increase our density making us kind of sink and drown. But a dead body, why do dead bodies float? Well, there's decomposing bacteria, and the respiration of these decomposing bacteria produces loads of gases, which will decrease the overall density, causing dead bodies to float, which is a bit grim, but no body, no crime. So they started making these concrete boots for dead bodies so they don't rise up. Now I know that's a bit of a grim way to finish, but it is to do with density. But here's a nice picture of a kitten and a puppy. Here's another nice picture of a frog using a leaf as an umbrella. And that's it, we're done. We've done the first part of this section. Well done, that's all topic 5A and 5B done, which means the part one is done. And I will see you soon for part two, where we'll be talking about Newton. And I promise you there'll be plenty more Keanu Reeves. So congratulations on finishing part one. And I will see you soon for part two. Well done.